Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Duncan Shopsaw. I'm Director of Policy, Communications and Research at Lloyds Bank Foundation for England and Wales. Delighted on behalf of the Foundation and the researchers to welcome you here today to discuss our new research, The Value of Small in a Big Crisis, The Distinctive Contribution, Value and Experiences of Small Charities in England and Wales During the Pandemic. Um, first, a bit of Zoom etiquette. Uh, this is a webinar, so it's in a webinar format, so no one can be seen or heard apart from our panellists. So we won't know if you've gone and made a cup of tea or a small child has come in, it's all fine. Um, we've turned off the chat function, but we'll be using the Q&A function later in the research, later in the session, sorry. Um, this session will be recorded, um, so it'll be available afterwards. Alongside the slides will be shared afterwards, and we do encourage you please to read the research. If you haven't had the chance to read it yet, um, there's a web link in the chat function. If you'd like to share on social media today, either during this event or after the event, if you read the research and there's things you particularly like, please do use the hashtag value of small and tag us in at LBFEW. Delighted to be joined by just under 300 people with, with more expected, the vast majority of which are small and local charities themselves. We've also got some fund, other funders and a number of local authorities. So what's this all about? Why is this research? Why does it matter? Why small charities? At Lloyd's Bank Foundation, uh, we've been passionate, always been passionate, across our 35 years about small and local charities. We're privileged to fund and work with over 700 such charities working in communities right across England and Wales, helping people overcome some of the toughest, most complex social issues. We know that the work that such charities, the work that many of you do is fantastic and as a foundation we support through funding, helped to develop and seeking to influence the environment nationally and locally in which you and they work. But whilst we know smaller local charities do excellent and important work, we often hear, and no doubt such charities often hear themselves, three sets of challenges. Size doesn't matter. What matters is what works. Or sector doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if a provider is a private or voluntary sector. And even organizational form doesn't matter. It's just about people volunteering, doing good. Doesn't actually matter if there's a charity there to direct and mobilize that activity. From what we know at the foundation, we know that they very much do all matter, size, sector, and organizational form particularly for vulnerable and disadvantaged people and communities. But we wanted to test this genuinely and independently. So in 2018, we invited a team of researchers to test this proposition. Did small and local charities actually offer something distinctive? And was this important and of value? And to cut a long story short, based on in-depth investigation in four case study areas, they found small charities were distinctive in who they worked with, how they worked, where they worked, and the wider role they played in communities. Size, sector and form does matter and has real and important value, particularly for those who need help the most and who are often ignored by um, or, or don't trust wider mainstream services. So when COVID struck last year, it obviously upended all of our lives with huge challenges, particularly for vulnerable individuals and communities and with big implications for charities of all sizes and types. Within the charity sector, there's obviously been, and rightly, a lot of focus on and discussion about income and the income implications of COVID for charities. But we wanted to also look at impact. What impact have charities had? And in particular, we thought we wanted to test back independently those findings from the 2018 Value of Small research. Because if small and local charities were important, distinctive and of value before COVID, then they should be even more so during COVID and COVID should prove that. Or if that couldn't be identified, then maybe small and local charities were more nice to have than we thought. So we asked the same research team to go back to those four areas and take an independent look. And the conclusions, as we're about to hear, were even stronger than before. Small and local charities have moved mountains and have done so precisely because they are distinctive and what they've provided has been of huge value to individuals, communities, and the public sector at the time when they were needed the most by people who needed them the most. So that's what we're here to explore today. In terms of today's agendas, agenda, we have the researchers and delighted that Chris and Lila from the Research Partnership are here to talk about the research. 
Baroness Diana Barron, the Minister for Civil Society and a former charity CEO herself will join us to give some reflections. And then we're gonna hear from uh, a re response from charities infrastructure and local public sector from four sides of the debate and across the four case study areas. You should have background information on each of the speakers in the information that was sent out in advance. We'll then have a little bit of Q&A uh, between them and open up to you. And Paul Streets, the foundation CEO, will um, respond and send us off on, on our way. It's a packed agenda um, and time is tight, but we know you're busy charities, so we wanted to pack it in two. But hopefully this will give you a good grounding in the research. But do go off and read it afterwards. And then, because why does this matter? Well, it matters for those of us who are funders or in government, it's crystal clear. We need to invest in support and encourage small and local charities. Think about the amount and type of funding we provide, how to better commission and how to support. But there's also a strong message here for small charities themselves. Don't hide your talents under a bushel. This research is your story. You are distinctive and can do what you do because of who you are and how you work. We'll try and tell that story, but we encourage you to tell that story too, to commissioners, funders and others. Size, specialism and being local matters. A pound to you will achieve far more than a pound to, to many other providers. So don't take my word for it. I'm delighted to hand over to Chris and Lila, two of the research partnership, who will take us through the key findings of the research. Many thanks. Over to Chris and Lila. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Duncan, for that introduction. Um, so on behalf of the researchers, we were delighted to be asked to uh, revisit our work. Um, and thank you for that. So as um, Duncan said, uh, Chris and I will take you through um, the research findings um, this morning. And we're going to do that in um, four main parts. I will give just a little bit of background to the research first. And then I'll talk about how small charities uh, responded to the pandemic and talk about the three core distinctive features of, the, of this response. And then I'll hand over to Chris, who will talk about the value that the charities brought to their communities and uh, some of the challenges that they faced before ending with a few um, policy recommendations. So a bit of background. Um, as Duncan has already said, um, this report, The Value of Small in a Big Crisis, builds on the original value of small research that we published in 2018. Um, and that, that identified three core distinctive features um, of smaller charities that lay in their service offer, in their approach, how they work, the way they work, and the position that they occupy in their communities and in relation to public services. And in that report, we suggested that it's this combination of distinctive features that creates the social and economic value that they bring that makes them more than the sum of their parts in some of the ways that Duncan has just described in his introduction. And we talk about the value that they bring to individuals, um, the value they bring to their local economies, and also the, uh, the value add that commissioners can achieve um, when they uh, support small organisations to provide services in their areas. So in revisiting uh, that 2018 research and in revisiting our four case study areas uh, to whom we are enormously grateful for making time at such a difficult, um, during such a difficult period, uh, they were Bassett Law, Ealing, Salford and Wrexham. Um, and in re revisiting them, we, we really wanted to do four main things. Um, we wanted to, of course, explore how smaller charities had responded during the pandemic and understand um, why that mattered to vulnerable people, vulnerable communities. But we also, as researchers, wanted to continue to build um, knowledge and understanding about the distinctiveness and value of smaller charities and then put that evidence in the hands of Lloyds, um, who's commissioned the research, but also many others who are on this call today that can really use that evidence to promote and develop support for small charities. So how did smaller charities respond to the pandemic? Um, well, I was thinking about this before I presented, and of course we all have our own version of events over the last year, um, based on our own chronologies and family stories and work histories. But based on the findings of this research and the evidence that we had to go on, uh, this is what we've picked out. 
um, phase one, um, a humanitarian crisis, uh, many charities called this their crisis period, absorbing the shock of lockdown. That's what they brought to communities. They then moved into a second phase and we've called that transition. Um, and that really was about adapting and adjusting provision in response to needs and circumstances. And of course we know this is what charities are fantastic at doing. They've always done this. And this is why I'm sure later on today, we'll hear conversations about how do you best fund small charities? How do you, uh, and the need to fund the whole organization in order for them to be capable of this kind of adaptation and adjustment. And then phase three, well, this is the hardest one to describe, things are still moving, but people started to talk about um, recovery or getting back to normal or the new normal. There's a lot of different language around about that, but it's something to do with putting plans in place to resume core provision that people really can't do without, but also facing up to um, the need to do things differently over the long term. So I'll now talk about um, what we found about the distinctive of, distinctiveness of smaller charities during uh, the pandemic. First, a distinctive service offer. So one of the things we found was, was um, that whatever their main or their usual focus, most charities that we spoke to were doing some or all of four things. They were providing access to food, they were alleviating isolation and loneliness, sometimes literally just by doing whatever they were doing in a friendly and compassionate manner. They were providing public health information and they were reducing, they were, they, they were addressing mental health and well-being. Now, who smaller charities supported really did set them apart as distinct from other types of providers. They could reach people disproportionately affected by COVID-19. They were trusted by people for whom, for a number of different reasons, the public health guidance on COVID was even more difficult to penetrate than all of us were finding. And they offered human contact, critically at a time when that was very scarce in other services that had um, become invisible or taken their um, services remote. And that human contact came up again and again. And if we turn now to a couple of the quotations that we picked up, people talked as this um, smaller charity in Wrexham, if somebody's got a real face and you know their name and where they live, it's very hard to say, oh, actually we're a bit risk averse, so we won't deliver any services. You can't, can you? You just can't do it. And there was another charity that we spoke to in Bassett Law, which said, of course our early reaction was to call up older vulnerable people. And then that turned into a new safe and well checks formalized service a little later on. Or this public sector stakeholder reflecting on their area and saying um, trusted organisations that operate in those neighbourhoods, of course, we'd want them to lead some of that key messaging um, about public health. I'll move on now to a distinctive approach. Here our findings were very, very clear. By showing up at the start and by sticking around for the duration, smaller charities were, were contrasted again and again with the public sector, who was who were for a number of very understandable reasons, slower to react, perhaps a little less personal, more remote, but also with mutual aid, where which did get on the ground um, quickly, but understandably again has dissipated over time with people going back to work or um, finding it hard to kind of coordinate in the long term. And what that means is that those small charities have been the consistent and trusted presence for vulnerable people and vulnerable communities throughout the pandemic. And of course, that's not done. That's continuing today. So um, here are uh, um, some public sector stakeholder reflections on this, um, talking about the way charities provide a consistent face, they speak to the same person and build a relationship and then comparing that with their own experience of feeling quite proud to have got an inquiry line up and running with 20 people, but acknowledging, of course, every time you call that inquiry line, you speak to a different person. Finally, um, a distinctive position. 
So smaller charities were recognised by the people we spoke to for their ability to reach certain communities and get support um, to them fast. Um, we've identified there and um, the kinds of communities we're talking about and um, you will have your own thoughts and ideas about that. Um, but what we really wanted to highlight here was that smaller charities were seen as trusted conduits for information and communication about the pandemic and we really can't stress that enough. They knew the right digital platforms to use, they knew the right language and terminology to use and in several cases they were able to spot when misinformation was traveling fast and causing people harm not only to their physical health and uh, protection from the pandemic but also their mental health and well-being. And the charities we spoke to were grateful for the recognition of the public sector um, about the distinctive position and role that they played. But we do want to note that there was some uncertainty from the charities we spoke to about the lasting impact of that recognition on their relationship with the public sector. And that was particularly the case among Black, Asian and minority ethnic led um, charities. But I'll finish with an encouraging example of public sector and smaller charity cooperation because there was really a great deal of that. Um, and this is an example, a great example that we came across in um, Salford, where three charities came together to, de to, to, um, to deliver support for a newly emerging group of people who were not known to mental health services, but really needed um, that mental health support uh, quickly. Um, and uh, the, the, the quotations that you can see here are typical of um, other quotations we picked up from um, public sector stakeholders, acknowledging the speed, the trust, the flexibility shown by smaller charities in responding to a pressing and urgent need. I'll now hand over to Chris. Thank, thanks, Lila. Um, so yeah, as, as Lila said, I'm going to be speaking about the, the value of small charities during the pandemic. And at this point, I think it's really important to stress that this value stems directly from those distinctive features that we've, we've, just, we've just discussed. And this quote kind of early on, this really does bring, bring this, bring this kind of bring this to the fore. It's from a public sector stakeholder ambassador who said who really emphasizes the values of these small charities and highlights how essentially what they're there to do is to keep communities safe, alive and well. So in that sense, it was inevitable that they responded in the way that they did. Thinking about the specific types of value, the first type of value we identified is value to individuals and communities. And as, as we've already heard, smaller charities work to promote and preserve the well-being of people in, in individuals and communities has been to the fore throughout the pandemic. They've been keeping people physically safe and well through the provision of medicine and food. They've been reducing the impact on mental health brought about by lockdown, shielding and social distancing by maintaining contact on telephone, social media, even doing doorstep visits for people. And they've been providing the information to people confused by government communication or by rumours that are circulating, might be circulating in their community. And they've been giving them the accurate information that they need. And what this has done is ensured that people and communities are in a much better position to emerge from the pandemic than they might otherwise have been the case. And hopefully that will follow through in terms of less need for acute public services. Then there's the value to the economy and although the, the, the pandemic has seen a severe economic downturn and funding pressures that are likely to reduce the economic footprint of smaller charities, we think this has been maximised because what we've seen is that they've continued to employ local people throughout the pandemic, they've made limited use of furlough, they've not yet, fingers crossed, had to make many redundancies, they've been able to access pots of funding that support the crisis response that could not been brought in to the economy by other providers, so they've been there present in the, in the economy in ways that perhaps private se some private sector providers haven't been. But at the same time, there's concerns about the grants and funding being small scale and short term and really unlikely to have offset the loss of income that some charities might have been getting from rental or trading over this period. So that there's, there's, there's lots of concerns there. Then there's the value to public services. And in the first report, we didn't, we didn't make this an explicit set of, set of kind of source of value, but I think it's really important to emphasize it this time around. 
because as we've heard, most smaller charities focus their work on supporting those people and communities most likely to be affected by COVID-19, either because of their existing health or mental health conditions or other forms of social and economic disadvantage. And in doing so, they reduce the risk of people in those extremely clinically vulnerable groups of actually contracting the virus. And they did this in ways that incurred very little additional cost to the public sector. And hopefully this minimised demand on the health system at a time when acute care really was stretched right to the limit. And this, of course, is in addition to the longer term upstream preventative benefits that, that will, have, will accrue from mitigating the wider effects of lockdown on those groups. And then finally, there's the added value that smaller charities bring. And we, we think there's three main ways that they did this, particularly adding value to what was happening locally during the pandemic. Firstly, they used their networks and partnerships to really make sure that that initial crisis response and what's followed has been as effective as possible. They did things like reassign staff and volunteers to new roles to meet new needs as they emerge, kind of boxing and coxing in the way that only small charities really can. And as we've heard, they communicated those messages to communities where, where it might not be getting through and it was identified that they really did need additional support to understand what the, what the effect of the pandemic might be and what they needed to do. Um, at the same time, and as we've heard already, many smaller charities, including those Black, Asian, and minority ethnic led organisations in particular, feel that this value that we're describing here remains poorly understood by key, key stakeholders. And we think perhaps the pandemic provides an opportunity to rethink the value of smaller charities and maybe rethink about think it in terms of the capacities, the different capacities that they brought to the crisis. First of all, there is that absorptive capacity, their ability to soak up the immediate impact of the crisis, of the shock of lockdown, to continue to kind of meet their charitable objectives wherever possible. Then there is the adaptive capacity that they've shown throughout the pandemic, innovating, adjusting, to, to new needs and circumstances as they, as they arrive. And then there's the transformative capacity. This is, their, this is their role in the social and economic recovery from the pandemic. And here, this is where there's real concerns that the current policy environment is stifling their ability to, to, to really be, play a proactive role in that. And ultimately, we think we need to recognise that Smaller charities' response to the pandemic is evidence of their value. We need to understand this, that their value is the fact that they were there and they responded. And that social value runs through everything that they do. And embedding understanding of policy is going to be absolutely vital moving forward. Of course, the pandemic has really presented lots of challenges to smaller charities as well. And what we were struck by was how consistent these charities were, regardless of field of operation or size. And we think this reflected the sheer force or universality of the shocks that were being faced. And, and three things really, really came out for us through the research. The first was around services and needs and, and community needs. And what we saw was kind of increases in existing need being managed at the same time as changes in need linked to the adverse impacts of COVID-19. And smaller charities really kind of having to figure out how to adjust, how to, uh, how to support those existing needs whilst identifying, addressing new needs at the same time, maintaining that balance in that. Obviously, there's real financial and human resource issues going on with smaller charities. They were seeing declines in funding, funding unpredictability and vol volatility and concerns that whilst the specificity of funding for COVID-19 activity was welcome, this might be detracting from from other, other opportunities for funding and concerns that this was limiting their ability to plan for the longer term. At the same time, on the human side, real concerns emerging about staff well-being and how to guard against burnout as people have been running at 100 miles an hour for so long. And then finally, thinking about challenges around their relationships and the networks. And one of the things that came out was this tension between online and face-to-face -face provision. It's been fantastic that so many smaller charities have been able to go online and provide online support, but really what they want to do is get back to face-to-face -face support as soon as possible. Um, there are also challenges around retaining volunteers and thinking about how the pandemic has changed the way that volunteering might look in the future. And still some concerns around coordination at a local level and whether or not there is duplication whether the work of smaller charities is really being recognised by everybody. And this comes out in some of the quotes 
fund that I'm going to talk to now. So here, here a smaller charity in Ealing talking about the, the needs that were emerging and founding a family that was living in a shed was one extreme example. Another charity here in Wrexham talking about the real importance of unrestricted funding for them moving forward if they were to carry on doing what they do. Another charity here talking about how their funding has been significantly adversely affected and then the concerns about what that meant for them moving forward. And then finally, another, another charity in Salford highlighting the fact that for some communities, actually, they're not online and on, an online service provision is not an option. They can't even afford to pay for the internet, so we can't rely on online service provision on its own moving forward. So what does that mean for, for policy and for kind of how we move forward? And we think what we need here is a call for national and local action. National and local action about how we foster local ecosystems of providers who are capable of absorbing, of adapting and contributing to the transformational change that we were needed. We think there's five, five things that could be done to help achieve this. First of all, we think we need to put what the idea of fostering a thriving and resilient population of small charities. That needs to be an explicit public policy goal at all levels, at the local and national level. And we also need to recognise that the fate of small charities in, is inextricably linked to those of the local public sector. And until we have a fair and equitable and sizable settlement from go central government for the local public sector, that's going to be an ongoing, ongoing challenge. Kind of. Linked to that, we think what's absolutely vital is long-term, flexible core funding for smaller charities from a diverse range of sources. We also think there's a need to invest in more social and community infrastructure. We've seen how that's been to the fore over the past 12 months. And we think perhaps if physical infrastructure investment is going to be the focus of the social and economic recovery, that needs to be accompanied by community, social and community investment at the same time. We think we need to put social value and well-being at the heart of public procurement and commissioning. It seems a really positive step over the last few months in the revisions to the Social Value Act, but it's not going far. It's not going far enough. And it's not going fast enough. And finally, we need to do more to make sure that we enhance digital inclusion and the ability of smaller charities to deliver digital services moving forward, to give them a more sustainable platform. That's the end of the formal research findings. I'd just like to kind of share some thanks. Thanks, first of all, to the foundation and all the smaller charities who engaged with us, but also to Lila and James, who are the report co-authors, and Ellen, Beth, Katie, Carol, and Vita, who led on the, the case study research. And who, you know, without them, this wouldn't this report wouldn't be possible. There's some links here to download the reports from different sources, and I think they're going to be made available at the end of the presentation as well. So, yeah, thanks everybody for listening. I hope you found the research useful, and and you'll be able to use it moving forward to promote your work. Many thanks, Chris and Lila. Uh, that was great. Um, uh, I'm going to say there's, a, there's seven words you need to take away from it for, about small and local charities. The, the first pair is distinctive and of value. Then how they showed up and stuck around during COVID and they absorbed the crisis. They adapted continuously. They transformed lives and communities and have the potential to keep transforming if we can get that policy and funding environment right. So thank you very much. For those who've asked, the slides will be available afterwards and, um, and the research. Do please look at it. There's a great summary of only uh, about 12 pages long, so no excuse not to read it, but thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Chris, Lila, all the research team and all of the participants in the research. We couldn't have done it without you. I'm now delighted to welcome Baroness Diana Barron, the Minister for Civil Society. Um, uh, to join us, give some of her reflections on the research and um, how this fits into her context um, as Minister. So, um, uh, Baroness Barron, delighted to have you here and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Duncan, thanks very much. And um, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm absolutely delighted to. I'm just a tiny bit anxious about my internet. So you might have to just step in, Duncan, if it crashes, because it's behaving badly this morning. Just one prompt, Diana, you've got your notes just over the camera. There you go. Oh, brilliant. I thought it wasn't over the camera. Okay, I'll have <laughs> my notes now. on my Fine. keyboard. 
but it's then perfect. I look down, you know, the challenges of Zoom. Anyway, it's, it's lovely now. to be with you all. Um, can I just start? Duncan uh, gave me a bit of a heads up about who was in the audience. And I gather there are lots of local organisations who have uh, showed up and stuck around to steal your words, Duncan, um, over the last year. And I just want to say a massive thank you on behalf of everyone in government and everyone in your communities uh, for all that you have done and are still doing. And I know how uh, incredibly exhausting uh, that can be, but also incredibly important. So thank you. Um, uh, so I suppose I just wanted to start by saying um, government honestly doesn't need convincing about the value of small charities. Uh, I think we're very clear about the role that small charities play in their communities. I remember when I came um, into this role, and some of you will know I used to run a charity that started unbelievably small and I guess got to about middle sized. Um, so have shared some of your uh, joys and pain along the way. But I uh, I talked to a friend when I started in this role and I said, you know, what are the important things I should think about? And he said to me uh, that the uh, that communities will have the solutions to their problems within them. Um, so look to the community to solve its own problems and build on the strengths of that community. And I think genuinely that's what we've tried to do in a few different ways and I guess the most notable of those um, was that in the funding package which we announced for the sector uh, last year uh, the 750 million pounds um, of grant funding uh, the largest single kind of chunk of that 200 million pounds was distributed through the National Lottery Community Fund. I hope that many of you were beneficiaries of that. Um, and that was clearly explicitly and intentionally seeking to support not every small local charity, but particularly those small local charities that had a role to play in the response to COVID and the pressure that put on our communities, either by protecting the NHS and preventing um, uh, in additional pressures on the NHS, but also pro providing the critical services, whether it be uh, food banks or loneliness support or uh, support for young people throughout. Um, so that's, you know, I think um, we put our money where our mouth was, so to speak. And similarly, we were pleased to partner with a lot of very expert philanthropists and foundations, including uh, the Lloyds Bank Foundation for England and Wales with our Community Match Challenge. Um, and uh, that those funds found their way again um, through a range of funders uh, to multiple um, small local organisations and particularly, Duncan, I hope I'm allowed to say this, in the case of the funding we did with Lloyds to a very high proportion of small organizations led by uh, BAME leaders, which we were delighted um, to be part of and look forward uh, to learning from that and all our other grants. So I think that um, we're really uh, clear on the value of that. Looking forward there in terms of how we, you know, we're approaching this, I think, and, I, and thinking about the recommendations um, from Ivar, I guess we see them as interlocking rather than separate recommendations. Um, I might push back a little bit about the commitment around social value because, um, you know, we've just introduced in January of this year uh, the new rules around social value procurement and working very hard with charities uh, and with procurement officers across government to make those a reality. But that's 49 billion pounds of government procurement. Uh, and, you know, 10% of that going to the VCSE uh, uh, sector is a massive, massive boost. 
um, and uh, to the sector, but also importantly to the communities that we serve and that we hope to reduce uh, the inequalities that we see there. So I think having a thriving um, small charity sector can't really be separated from investing in community infrastructure and from good uh, social value focused public procurement. So in my mind, it's a kind of Venn diagram um, uh, with interlocking um, elements. Uh, we've also announced uh, a green paper on procurement and that is open to consultation um, until I think the 24th of March, but I may have got the date wrong, but uh, we would really encourage you all if you have time um, to share any thoughts that you have on that paper because it is uh, important and will shape um, our thinking as we go forward. So, you know, we're really grateful. Personally, I've had huge support from the sector. There are colleagues in the sector who did uh, weekly and then fortnightly calls, particularly some of the smaller volunteering organizations through NAVCA. Um, I had calls, as I say, on a weekly basis for most of last year, just trying to hear what's really happening on the ground. I'm also supported by a group of uh, BAME leaders of charities. So we definitely value and listen um, and thank you uh, for all your work and the hope that some of the government schemes going forward, like the implementation of the Social Value Act, like the Leveling Up Fund and the Share Prosperity Funds, will make a real difference uh, and give you opportunities to thrive, to be independent, uh, and to deliver what your communities need. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Minister, and uh, for the specific comments and the general support for the vital role that smaller local charities are playing. Um, if I may, can I ask you one question, and some of this has come through the Q&A, um, which is, um, so you, you rightly referenced the, the focus within the 750 million um, to go to smaller charities but much of that money is due to come to an end in March 2021, so just in a, a month and a half or so. And many charities, as this research captures and other learning, are worried about you know, the impacts of COVID are carrying on, the inequalities that have been highlighted by COVID, the work carries on of these charities, and they're worried about the cliff edge beyond that. Um, can you, there's a budget coming up you, last week, some, lots of the voluntary sector was emphasizing what charities are doing right now, day in, day out. Um, have you got any thoughts you can share on what that more medium to longer term petition might be for the government in terms of funding and other support for the sector? Um, so thank you uh, for that. Um, I mean, I guess a couple of things. First of all, you know, I think the government really did uh, do what we could to um, protect the work of charities over the last year, uh, whether it was uh, giving charity workers key worker status from the get go, uh, allowing volunteering through the pandemic. Um, and obviously the 750 million was the first targeted package that was announced by the government, uh, as well as obviously all the cross sectoral schemes. And those aren't in any way, I'm not trying to suggest this is about generous or not generous, it's just about doing the right thing and recognizing the value of the sector. Looking forward, um, uh, I am obviously aware of the concerns in the sector. I think our um, main focus is on how can we get the economy open again. Uh, clearly the need for the emergency package last year reflected in particular the loss of public fundraising. Um, so those organizations that rely on small and large fundraising events, charity retail shops, etc. Um, and that's why you know the Prime Minister's speech yesterday was so important because we do now have a path to exiting from that and organizations can now start to think about uh, public fundraising again, reopening charity retail and so forth um, and it might need to look a little bit different 
Um, but I think the charity is nothing if not agile and creative in that regard. So um, that's where our focus is now. Obviously, we're looking and um, we pull together a group across Whitehall. So if there are specific issues uh, in specific subsectors, the voluntary sector, uh, um, you know, we want to know about those and try and understand what's going on. Uh, but really it is trying to make sure that the doors are open to the voluntary sector to access government money, as I mentioned, through the Social Value Act, but we're also working with a group of charities looking at how charities can use the Kickstart scheme more. So there are doors that we can lean on that open up money. But if you're asking me, will there be another dedicated package? My understanding is no. Uh, thank you uh, for that clarity. That's um, helpful to know, and but to hear about the wider support. Um, thank you very much, uh, Baroness Barron. We will, uh, as Lloyds Bank Foundation and any others on this call and elsewhere, will continue to keep ensuring that you're uh, um, informed and aware of everything that's happening and, and together hoping to, that we can ensure charities show, can show up, stick around uh, for, for many months and years to come. Thank you very much. Yeah. For Appreciate. Thanks. Uh, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you. We are now going to move on to hear directly from four um, uh, people from the four case study areas representing the four different perspectives involved in the research. We're going to ask us some headline reflections of up to three minutes, and then we're going to have a wider discussion, picking up some of the questions you're posing in the Q&A. So I'm delighted to kick off with Shamaki from GoSad, who's an Ealing-based charity, um, working with diverse communities in Ealing. Um, Shamaki, if you would uh, like to respond, uh, do please turn on your camera. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, OK. Um, I think uh, everything that has been said uh, uh, actually reflects um, what happened when the pandemic started. Um, basically, um, our, our offices closed on the 18th of March. And um, when it closed, um, we had about 370 users using our different services. And most of them are from the BME communities and uh, mostly from refugee communities and also uh, like the Nepalese communities. And, and you can imagine it was a shock to them, also a shock to us as an organization. And, um, you know, it just shows that there's uh, the value uh, placed on small organizations because what happened is that um, we found that, um, you know, people actually calling us because they're panicking, uh, people who sue speak different languages, you know, they cannot communicate properly in English. Um, we particularly had uh, a number of um, Syrian refugees and they were the first actually to stop coming to our services because most of them had experience of uh, biological warfare in their countries. So when they had their COVID in the air, they um, completely stopped coming to our services, but we later on came to find out. So we had to support them. Um, and also um, everything that you've had in this presentation in terms of the value of small organizations, um, they were the first port of call for uh, a lot of people in different communities. And also we found that, uh, uh, for example, in Ealing, there's a few small organizations that never had funding, but we saw them actually also helping people. Um, and it just shows that, um, you know, the kind of mobility um, uh, was much quicker but at the same time, there was not enough funding or support. People felt they had to do something. And for me, this was almost like <laughs> what the government used to talk about uh, big society. We know big society existed before it was coined. Uh, so we found that uh, you know, people, the altruism, especially from charities and small organizations, it, sh it shone and came through. Um, and, um, you know, um, and also what we found also is that uh, and throughout the pandemic up to today, uh, the kind of inequalities. Uh, so inequality is not just about, um, you know, people in our communities who have continued facing inequality, but also you have organizations that, uh, some of those, for example, our organization, um, 
you know, we've been, it was set up by young people in 2003, and we haven't had like a permanent uh, location. We kept moving from place to place. So there's issues around, uh, you know, sustaining the work of, of, you know, small organizations, and also looking sometimes beyond the, um, uh, you know, infrastructure, second tier organizations, uh, actually going straight to these organizations and finding out what they actually do and the exp expertise that they have. Um, and I think this will actually continue uh, to show that, uh, you know, these organizations have got resilience, but also um, innovation because, for example, some of the work we had to do with other small organizations in Ealing resulted in us doing a, a research on the impact of, of, of COVID on the BME communities in Ealing. So this is a BME led organizations uh, with over 100 years of experience, but very small organizations uh, without sustainable funding uh, and also without support. Uh, and just maybe lastly, I can add, um, when you look at um, moving forward, when you look at capacity building, for example, uh, unfortunately uh, in the sector, you know, uh, capacity building is looked at, you know, so big organizations decide what's uh, suitable for small organizations. So they get funding and then they, uh, they, you know, they, they might do like, let's say, uh, uh, training sessions, maybe on fundraising and such things, but actually they're not helpful because uh, these are just training where an organization might send a volunteer because they're, they're you know, they won't be able to send, uh, you know, the, maybe the one staff that they have to attend the training. So, you know, we need to rethink everything about, you know, it has to be practical. Uh, funds has to come straight from the funders to small organizations. And also uh, looking at, um, you know, um, how funders can actually um, not just getting reports from this organization, but also uh, giving that kind of pastoral care and actually speaking to them uh, and, um, you know, um, seeing the kind of support they need. And I'll just add last thing, uh, if, if it's okay. Um, and also, I think we have to move away from the uh, BME or BME uh, uh, acronyms because unfortunately it lumps a lot of communities together, which I think is not fair. Uh, so for example, in Eden, we've got newly arrived refugees from Syria and other places. So you cannot compare the kind of issues that they face to maybe the Gujarati community who have existed maybe for 50, 60 years in Eden. Uh, and I think we need to look at, uh, you know, individual communities and how they're impacted, especially COVID has actually caused a lot of, uh, as we know, a lot of death. I mean, we have, I think, over 24 people who are our, our previous users have actually died from the pandemic and they're all from the BME communities. So I use the word, but so we need to look beyond just the, uh, those acronyms. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Shamaki, and definitely agree with that last point about either the lumping together and use of the acronym BAME for the lumping together of communities doesn't really help or serve or reflect the range of needs that you and other charities are meeting and the experiences of different communities. But thank you. Um, I'm delighted now to welcome Larissa Roberts. We're crisscrossing the country. We've gone from Ealing. We're now heading into Wales to Wrexham. And uh, she's Chief Executive at Advanced Brighter Futures and would love to invite you to give your reflections. Thank you. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, I think um, my reflections are all around that showed up and stuck around part of the report really and I think for many of the people joining us today it, it was similar in that initial shock phase for us um, it, it wasn't a question of whether we do it was it was how it was the only thing on our agenda in those first initial stages and I think that comes from the beauty of small charities that the decision makers and the people that are being supported are so close to each other they're not uh, removed so when when I was thinking about how we were going to do it I could tell you people's stories about who we, who we were helping um, you know I've answered the phone to them I've answered the, the door to them um, I've listened to their story so that made it easy um, skip past whether we were going to straight to how um, and I think I knew we had a good team in that first initial phase uh, but uh, that first week did 
Um, it surprised me even how well the team stepped up um, to that first initial stage. And I think the report really does reflect the original um, research that was done a few years ago in terms of how did we do it? Because um, I think that's important um, about the services we offer, our approach and our position within the community. I think that quick response early on demonstrated uh, that link that we could do it and the, the way that we did it was drawn from those original strengths really. Um, so yeah, that first bit was easier than I would have thought in a pandemic to get the staff team together and start discussing how we were, how we were going to adapt. Um, and it did take a lot of uh, adapting and absorbing, uh, like it says in the report. Um, but I think for me, um, the, you know, when we talk about the challenges in the report, one of the key things for me was uh, looking after the staff team um, because I knew that you know, it, within our organisation, it's all about people um, and that approach that was talked about in that first report about how we are person-centred, we have that human approach. Um, so I think the key for me in my position was looking after the staff because that's all of us, how we're all adapting ourselves. And I knew that if we looked after the staff, uh, the, the staff would look after everybody else. So... I think that was a key ingredient actually in, in what, how we did what we did was that we supported each other really well as a staff team. And um, it's all about that sort of walking the walk and doing, you know, practicing what we preach, I suppose. Um, one other thing that I thought when listening, you know, to others talking and from reading the report was about that distinctiveness of small charities um, is that, reaching people um, that maybe mainstream media and other organizations weren't reaching and it just popped into my head that in those first that first phase that shock phase I, I remember speaking to some I answered the phone and I remember speaking to somebody who hadn't even heard that it was a pandemic you know they couldn't believe uh, they didn't believe me when I explained to them I said you know it might be a little bit more difficult with what we can offer we're still formulating that but we'll be keeping you up to date and they said oh, what do you what do you mean what do you mean and I explained what was going on and he said well, if I turned on the news now it would be on the news I said you'd be the only thing on the news you know so I think that certainly popped back into my head when I read that bit in the report about reaching people who perhaps uh, were, were missed as well and um, that's an example of that really um, but yeah lots and lots of reflections uh, on the report fantastic report we've really enjoyed being part of it but um, I'll let us go back to Duncan. Great thank you Marissa and I think that's really important to remind us it's actually all about people so we talk about small and local charities but actually the fact that you as chief exec and your staff know your community when you're thinking about the services, you imagine in your mind's eye who you're helping. You're not in some head office ringing down to say, can you do something? But also that adapting and trans absorbing that we talked about in the research, that was done by people as well. And that was your staff and volunteers. But that also has a cost. You rightly talk about, look at, worry about burnout in the NHS, but there's real pressures on your staff team as we approach a year and then go forward. So thank you very much for rooting that back in people and for being involved in the research. So thank, thank you. Um, uh, now I want to move across to get a different perspective. So delighted to ask Stephen Brown, Head of Corporate Services at Bassett Law District Council to give his reflections from the public sector perspective of what it was that smaller local charities offered in Bassett Law and, and what we can learn from that. Thanks very much, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I do believe that this report makes a very powerful contribution to our understanding of the the importance of the relationship between the public um, sector and our voluntary and community sector co colleagues. It's uh, just almost a year since I moved out of my ivory tower in the uh, council offices and actually went to be co-located with our voluntary and community sector um, within their offices and have been able to observe firsthand many of the things that colleagues have touched upon in the presentation this morning 
So certainly, undoubtedly, was the speed of response from the from our local voluntary and community sector. And in Bassett Law, we're talking about um, very many smaller charities um, there. I think their understanding and focus on actual needs rather than perceived needs because they know those people, they understand, and as has already been said, they are, uh, already often have a relationship with many of the people. They have the connections and the agility to respond. I think also what came across to me was very much it's a trusted brand for many of these organisations that was so important at a time of uncertainty and a more personalised engagement than, than can be undertaken often by uh, councils, etc. And we were looking from a council perspective is almost, can you do something for us? That quick assessment of need that we needed, the provision of intelligence that comes from local communities. As I've mentioned, uh, Bassett Law, we're a very large rural community. So for me, uh, again, focus on place is really important. And throughout the pandemic, it's been shown to be a, a critical element in effective response. So just um, some further thoughts. Um, the the organisations are rooted in their communities. They come from those communities, so they understand the connections. They focus on the needs of individuals, so they're not silo-based, um, as we tend to be from a local authority perspective, looking at it from a service provider. Our voluntary community sector colleagues provide a much deeper relation, relational model. Um, in the report, that refute, there's an analogy of glue holding communities together. A further analogy I would use is that um, it's about being the oil in the machinery, the different cogs of the state at national and local level that often you are making those connections and actually making the system work for us. Designing solutions as well was something that really came home to me. Um, for the first time, I think a lot of organizations were actually trusted with data and we shared rather than finding barriers to sharing data. Um, we actually shared that data and that helped us um, put together a, a far better response. One of the things that many of my colleagues have reflected on is the complexity of needs that we're now dealing with that we've never seen. Uh, I've been a local government officer for 35 years um, and certainly the challenges that we're seeing at a local level are, are, are the greatest they've ever been. And the voluntary sector is absolutely critical in, in that response. The Royal Engineers have a, um, a phrase, first in, last out, when they deal with situations. So for certainly voluntary and community sector were first in. They're not last out because they're still there. The whole uh, lateral flow testing vaccination program is underpinned by volunteers. Layla identified three phases. The last phase was three, getting back to normal, and just some final reflections on that. What is normal? pandemic is going to have to be paid for and where is that money going to come from? Um, will it potentially dry up some of the sources uh, of support that come into our voluntary and community sector from local authorities, the inflexibility of funding streams that we see? Are we also going to revert to form as the um, public sector? And we're not actually going to learn the lessons from this, the relational model that I talked about that clearly demonstrates the opportunities actually to make savings when we're going to need to make savings around efficiency and effectiveness that can be delivered through earlier intervention. And that's so important to health inequalities and the huge mental health uh, issues are going to come out of the back of this. I mentioned about trusted partners and data. I'm concerned that that now is starting to slip back. And um, we're sort of patting voluntary community sector on the head now and sort of saying, thanks very much. And reverting back to form, we can see that in clunky commissioning models that favour larger organisations and the loss of distinctiveness. But I would end on a positive. The voluntary sector was here before local government. It will be here after um, changes in local government because it will adapt. It can adapt. It's nimble. It can do that. But the key to this is that focus on small. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, that was excellent as someone who's been in local government for over 30 years to have that reflect, set of reflections and some of those key things you highlighted about being trusted, the understanding of place, being there before. As with the report says, mutual aid in many areas did some great stuff, but charities were there already 
when you wanted from day one to say, how do we reach vulnerable older people, BAME communities or rural areas? And someone's asked a question about rural areas, check out the four report because Bassett law includes many rural areas. Um, you know, those charities were there dealing with complex needs um, and doing so efficiently and effectively, your point about money, a pound in a small charity will give you much more return than one that could get some money siphoned off to a head office somewhere uh, more remotely. Um, so thank you for that perspective and we'll come back to some of those points. Um, I'm delighted to now ask the, the fourth person, Michelle from Salford CVS, because another key part of this story is the great the role that excellent local infrastructure can play as small charities themselves often, but bringing together um, small charities and others and the local public sector. So Michelle, I'm delighted to have your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Um, I suppose uh, from our point of view as a local infrastructure organisation, the research reflected um, exactly what we found or the knowledge that, that we gained in terms of what um, small charities were doing. Um, what I want to talk about, though, what I want to pick up on is in the report, it talks about some of the factors that enable the distinctive response from the smaller charities. Um, and that is involvement of organisations like Salford CVS, who um, are enablers really and connectors. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit about the, the work that we did. I think one of our initial things, um, like many organisations, we did um, have a little bit of a dilemma around moving from um, working from within an office to um, online service provision. Um, but we did that successfully and we also managed to maintain um, an office function to enable us to better coordinate what was going on. We were in a unique position, um, really, in that we'd already worked with our local authority and public sector colleagues um, to be able to mobilise our sector and volunteers in an emergency response. So in a way, that made things a little bit simpler in terms of being able to coordinate a wider um, sector effort. The other thing we did is we called lots of our members to find out what they were experiencing, you know, what were their concerns for the people that they worked with, what were their concerns for themselves as organisations, um, and what, were, what was their capacity to adjust and to change and to meet the needs. Um, and that enabled us to be able to provide quite a bit of intelligence um, to our public sector colleagues about what was needed and en enabled us to actually shift our grants programme so that we could respond better to the needs and also to be able to mobilise um, volunteers and get them engaged in providing additional capacity to those organisations. Um, we also, uh, as you could read in the report from our case studies, we coordinated public sector and voluntary sector response by creating, um, in Salford, our city mayor um, launched the spirit of Salford to demonstrate how um, public sector organisations and communities all to come together to demonstrate the spirit of the city. Um, so we quite quickly brought together public sector partners and BCSE organisations to develop um, what we call the Spirit of Salford Network, which provided a coordination um, response, if you like, to um, COVID. And that really helped us um, make sure that we were supporting those small charities, um, making sure that, that where possible, there wasn't a duplication of effort. And some of the outcomes of that is that we managed to readjust our small grants programme um, and focus on, um, I think the report mentions that there a lot of um, smaller charities stood up around accessing food. So we were enabled to readjust our small grants programme to support the access to food, whether that was around um, supporting people to get shopping, people who, were afford who could afford to access food but couldn't get help out because they were isolated, or whether that was people couldn't access food because of poverty. Um, and so we, we diverted quite a bit of our grant funding into um, the provision of food um, for uh, families. We also um, did quite a bit of work around um, isolation and loneliness. Um, we pulled together some organisations to actually do some um, stay in touch calls with people that were very isolated or, or lonely, um, supported access to IT, 
um, and also um, within the report, um, some BCSE organisations got together to set up um, a new uh, mental health service, which is called Beyond. I guess one of the things we have um, a larger proportion of um, Orthodox Jewish population and part of the funding that we were um, used enabled us to support smaller charities to provide culturally and religiously appropriate food for our Orthodox Jewish community and also for our Muslim community. Um, I think for us, we, we identified as part of our stay in touch calls with um, our smaller charities. Um, there were worries and that those worries still remain about the financial impact or financial implications um, of the COVID response um, and uh, ongoing concerns about the higher than normal demand and whether um, there will be that continuing capacity to um, support members of the community. Um, I, I think the other thing to note is that we found quite a number of organisations had ceased um, service delivery because they were peer support, they provided peer support type activities um, and some of those struggled to move to um, online. Um, but what they did do, which, which was really reassuring, is they managed to remain in contact with uh, the people that they provided services to and that enabled them then to identify other individual needs or issues that, that they could then um, get support from, from, from the wider system. So I guess that's a bit of a snapshot tour of what it felt like for us for a, a, an infrastructure um, organisation constantly responding to the needs of the organisations that we serve. Great, thank you, Michelle, uh, and thank you all, all four of you. That was great. Um, if you all four want to turn your cameras on, that would be excellent. We're also joined by James, one of the researchers, um, and we've got just over ten minutes for some questions. We've had some good questions in, so I'm going to direct them to. Um, and one of the questions is, um, it's a it's a phrase that I don't like. Someone, but is the phrase silver linings? I don't think there's many silver linings out of COVID, but I do think we have all those adaptations that people have talked about, there are some positive things there. So just would be interested um, in headline reflections on something you're gonna do differently due to COVID going forward. Um, and uh, Steve, when I come to you, it'd be particularly interesting to get your take on how that might mean you fund and support local charities in Bassett Law um, differently. Um, I'm gonna to come to Larissa first because also one of the questions people have rightly highlighted, and we're very conscious of this as a foundation, is that what's happened in England and Wales is also being different. Baroness Barron was talking from a very England perspective. But um, anything particularly you're going to do differently and anything that you might want to reflect on in terms of how local government or Welsh government has responded to you. Thank you. OK, it's quite a few questions in one. Yeah. <laughs> Silver lining and anything Welsh specific you want to highlight. OK, so in terms of silver lining, I think what is brought to us is that actually moving some of our services online and, and offering a lot more remote support during the period has allowed us to reach further than we were reaching uh, already. Um, so there was particular pockets in Wrexham, maybe rural communities or people uh, with childcare issues or transport issues uh, that weren't able to access some of the services the way that we delivered them pre the pandemic. So actually that has opened us up to maintaining that within what we do going forward, whatever happens in this sort of new normal and um, that actually we wanna continue being able to offer that and reaching people uh, through those means. Um, and people have fed back to us uh, that that has been a better way of of accessing services um, by having remote remote options. So I think that is something positive, certainly that's that's come out. And, and obviously, having those sort of challenges um, and having to adapt has brought out str stronger bond within the staff staff and volunteer team, but also um, new skills within the staff and volunteers. Uh, team as well you know we had a couple of men at first we set up these uh, videos uh, that we were doing every week and all staff were getting 
involved, but um, we quickly discovered that we had a couple of staff members that it was like a natural talent for. So uh, that was a, a positive as well. In terms of uh, the difference between England and Wales, I think there have been some differences. I think one of our one of our funders got a lot of support from uh, from English government to match fund um, to match fund their their support their offer to um, charities, but unfortunately that didn't apply to Wales. So there was you know there's different uh, different things that were going on for that those specific differences. But then I suppose there would be other other benefits of being in Wales, but perhaps Welsh government responded to that. I'm not aware that whether England did or not. So um, yeah, it's an interesting discussion point. Great, thank you. We know in other areas, the Welsh government did do some more than the English government. So top swings and roundabouts, um, they put some more money through WCVA and more money for financial assistance through the discretionary assistance fund for individuals. Um, um, I'm gonna to come to Stephen get your um, silver lining, I'm sorry, I'm stuck with that term, and uh, how you're gonna to respond to charities differently and to then go to Shamaki after that and to, there's quite a lot of questions Shamaki about um, black, Asian and minority ethnic led charities and whether there'll be any longer term change in how they're viewed and funded. So just to give you a heads up to sort of get your reflections on that would be great. Um, but Stephen. I think in terms of the relationship uh, we have as a council with our volunteer and community sector, it is, it is generally positive. Funding is inevitably going to be an increased pressure point, um, as has been mentioned throughout this morning. And I think from our perspective, we are going to face funding challenges. We are obviously already have funding challenges. So it's what can we do to protect that funding that we have left that is available for voluntary community sector. And I think particularly as a district council, so we're not involved with adult social care, children's services, so we tend not to be commissioning the services. It's that the importance of that flexibility um, in our funding and trying to avoid being too restrictive, particularly with small organisations that don't have um, the capacity to go through com complex procurement arrangements, um, funding bids, etc. I do think what we need is a, a shared understanding of what the priorities are moving forward and how the distinctiveness of the voluntary and community sector in responding to those challenges. So that's clear. I think also be more, more imaginative about the way we can support the sector, co-location, um, shared office space, working on joint bids, um, supporting uh, also other things that we need to continue moving forward and articulating that the importance of place and of the importance of local communities and demonstrating to other parts of the public sector the, the, the messages underpinned in your report about how effect ultimately this gener the sector generates money in the local community and it can save money it can save you know the public pound as well through its effectiveness and its efficiency and its understanding of those communities and we need to get that understood at all levels of government thank you duncan thanks Stephen. i think that last point is really important a pound with a smaller local charity goes much further it's reinvested in its local economy it mobilizes volunteers it goes to where it's needed and we need to get that message across um and we're delighted as the foundation to be working with you in Bassett Law more broadly around how organisations, public and private and voluntary can better work together. Okay, Shamaki, it'd be really good to get your reflections on any quote unquote silver linings, but also respond to questions about, do you think there is any change in attitude to um, black Asian minority ethnic led charities and whether that will survive and sustain and particularly in terms of funding going forward? Thank you. I think I'll start with the silver lining. Uh, and um, I think since the pandemic started, as everybody's mentioned, uh, you know, um, everybody, you know, small, mostly small organizations, they've actually done a lot in terms of, um, you know, supporting the users. But just as uh, Larissa was saying, uh, also we've learned a lot, uh, basically. And uh, just as an example, um, you know, we've... Uh, got additional volunteers that we never anticipated 
So we were surprised, of, you know, people from communities, you know, you know, people who are maybe not have engaged with the organization previously were actually engaging. Uh, and also it also shows that, um, you know, um, there's, um, I think the pandemic has somehow uh, brought people together. And I think we need to, um, you know, I think somebody put on the chat about families and individuals. Uh, we also have to look at, uh, it doesn't have to be small charities or bigger charities. We should look at, uh, you know, us as a community, like, regardless of who, you know, who we are. And I think that, that's been very positive. And uh, uh, we are going to have more volunteers actually who are gonna support the charity, uh, some who are teachers, and I think that's amazing. Uh, just coming back to the BME uh, kind of, uh, there's a bit of controversy for me uh, because I said it's about uh, the terminology. For me, I'm not happy with the terminology. And if, um, so um, I brought five organizations, BME led organizations in, um, in Ealing and I did a research, uh, a report, hopefully this can be shared maybe with people who come to this uh, event. And it talks about, you know, all the different issues. It talks about solutions. It talks about um, inequalities that have existed. Um, so basically in, in an ideal world, you know, we should not have all the different communities, but unfortunately we can see uh, some communities have continued to suffer. So if I give another example about healing, I think the, 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 ne the next, this census that I think is gonna happen this year, uh, I think by the end of the census, uh, it's estimated uh, more than 50% of residents in Ealing will be from the like BME communities. Uh, despite that, that being the fact, there's some communities from, uh, so some ethnic communities who are continuously suffering. I mean, one of the organizations that are engaged in the research um, it's a, they work with Afro-Caribbean communities and they were set up in 1971. Over the years, they've given up because uh, they were either used by other big organizations uh, to provide services and they've been nomads moving from place to place. So what they've done over the years, they've used their, their own money, they've used their own uh, you know, uh, community members who are maybe experts in different things. And that's quite, um, it's quite telling. So healing also what they've done uh, from our report and I think other reports, they, they've commissioned, uh, so they put together a, a commission that looks at inequalities, but the problem with the local authority is that, is that uh, you know, they, they're gonna do this for about six months. And the policy around it is that, you know, uh, the local authority doesn't have to, um, uh, they don't have to follow all the recommendations that this commission is going to do. So the problem also what we are seeing is that there's a lot of knee-jerk knee reactions. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of like BME kind of research, look at inequalities uh, and, and people speaking to people who uh, uh, sometimes are not part of those communities. So, you know, we have to be careful about, you know, tick boxes and uh, we should actually uh, focus on, 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 um, on these organizations. Uh, even for example, the traveler community, for example, they've suffered a lot. So, um, yeah, so I think there's a silver lining, but I think we need to change how we look at uh, different communities and how we, um, we articulate their needs and how you know, they're able to be supported. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm very conscious of time. I'm just going to ask Michelle to give you a very quick headline reflections um, and James, one super quick last reflection on what struck you most about the research before I hand over to Paul. Okay, go for it, Michelle. Thank you. I guess I, I will be very quick. Um, our silver lining really is to advocate for the difference that small grants have made really and, and, the, and the flexibility um, that funders have shown to actually meet the needs, you know, rather than have a broad heading, they've responded and, and changed to meet the needs of organisations and the communities they've served. Um, also volunteering, volunteering as um, certainly in Salford, we've had a huge response of um, individual members of the community wanting to engage in volunteering and we would, the silver lining is that we would hope that would continue. And also, I guess from our point of view, we saw um, really, really quick, flexible partnership working between our sector and our public sector colleagues. And, and some of that, it was unnatural for our public sector colleagues who tend to be slightly more risk um, averse. And actually, 
they took quite a bit of risk and I think what, what we would like to continue to advocate for as Salford CVS is to continue to, to um, utilise that innovation to tackle poverty, inequality and all of the other issues that have been flagged up as a result of COVID. Thank you very much. Innovation and collaboration between sectors. And Jay, thank you. That's brilliant. And James, uh, sorry, just to bring you in here. Any head as part of the research team, what's just a headline reflection on what struck you most about this research? Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, everyone. Um, fascinating to hear those reflections. I think particularly struck by, you know, the, the way that some of the message, the key messages from the report really re seem to have resonated with you. So it's fantastic to hear that. I think just briefly, I'd, I'd return uh, quickly to something Duncan said right at the beginning, and that's the idea of not hiding your light under a bushel. Um, I think one of the things we were quite struck by as a research team was, was the extent to which we're working in an environment in which, um, you know, quite understandably, a lot of the uh, kind of wider response to what happened uh, around COVID-19 was, was kind of um, emphasizing the response of very micro level responses, neighborhood uh, and community responses. Um, mutual aid groups and so on and, and I think the message that government took away from that was that that was where the real kind of exceptional innovation um, and activity was happening and I think we were, we, we in a sense were kind of re redressing the balance and, and trying to draw attention to the fact that actually a huge amount of really agile and innovative work was happening in, in the small uh, voluntary sector and, and charity sector um, and you know, in in a sense, we went out there to kind of with an open mind to to look for some of that, and we were really struck by what was out there. Um, we've heard huge amounts about that today, and I, I think it's really important that we kind of get the message out to government that that is happening. That government, uh, the charities were were really there and responding, even if they weren't always perhaps seen as being at the, the very full forefront of that. Um, so I think the report the report highlights that and really lays out in in considerable detail. Um, the, the important aspects of that. And, and we're really uh, pleased that, that, that we've had this opportunity to, to kind of get that message out, I guess. Thank Thanks, you, James. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Shamaki. Don't hold your, talent, your talents and achievements under a bushel. Wave them around. Hit commissioners over the head. Make sure they all knew what you did. Um, there was, uh, thank you. So we didn't get to respond to all the questions. Just to say there were some questions from other funders. If you're another funder and want to know some learning, get in touch with us. Our regionally-based grant managers would love to talk to you about how we might help you better fund small charities too. Thank you all very much and a grateful to hand over to Paul to wrap us up, thank you. Okay, thanks Duncan and thank you speakers. Um, so COVID is a humanitarian crisis on a really vast scale. Normally we see these things on our TV, this time we've seen it on our doorsteps, we've seen it around the corner, we've seen it in neighbourhoods next to us. And we've heard through this work how small charities have stepped up to meet that need in terms of who they reach, establishing trust, that human contact, and most of all, that speed. As important as the NHS, and yet not valued in the same way as the NHS generally, even though many NHS services and other public services are, are dependent on what small local organisations have done to stem demand, as Stephen has told us. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us. There are 321 people on this call. You, there were people from all four corners of England and Wales. Um, there's going to be a poll, by the way, up here as I'm speaking, and we're really keen that you fill that in so we get feedback on this event and we can then improve events going forward. So you can fill that out as, as you're listening, but a few closing comments from me. First of all, key is with any kind of research, what you're going to do with it. Um, for us at Lloyds Bank Foundation, this reaffirms the importance and our commitment to small local organisations and the importance that they have to local communities. We need to think about the recommendations. As if you're a funder, you should be thinking about long-term, flexible, ideally unrestricted funding for smaller organisations. It's what they need most right now. And that would include local authorities, more of a partnership approach. If you're a local authority or central government, we need to really think through what social value means. We're concerned that social value is being commercialised and commoditised. And actually, social value should be about investment in local economies. And this report just shows how important that is and how much small local charities are an important facet of employment in local, local economies as well as the work they do to reach the most, dis the most disadvantaged people. If you're an infrastructure body, we need to be thinking about how you support small local organisations around their workforce. Charity leaders are incredibly stressed and we're at the beginning of this journey, we're not even the end of it yet, because uh, it's going to be two, three years before you begin to see the recovery that we're going to have to have as we come out of health lockdown. And that support on digital. We've seen some fantastic digital transformation, but we've also seen digital exclusion really come to the fore as being a major issue for the most disadvantaged in our society. Small charities have been there because you have been there, the 321 people on this call. There are people today who are alive. There are people today who are safe. 
they wouldn't be safe otherwise. There are people today who've had enough food over the last year and will continue to get support from you with those really vital things. Support people who who are informed and wouldn't have been informed, wouldn't have known where to go, perhaps because of the Black, Asian, ethnic minority community wouldn't know it, and arrived refugees and folks in Samak Shamaki and the work, the work that he does. For us, we'll be thinking about what we do with this. For us, it's a package. Our funding increasingly will be long term if we can if we can provide that, and it will be unrestricted wherever possible. Um, we will. We've also launched something called a small charities data hub, which will be linked to shortly on in the chat which actually gives up-to-date data on what's happening in small charities. We published a report recently with Akivo and NCVO, which looked at rebalancing the relationship. In the chat, some of you talked about the need for contracting to be rethought, in particular the relationship between small local organisations and large nationals, whether frankly they're private sector organisations or large charities, to be rethought so it's collaborative and not competitive, and we published that a couple of weeks ago. And we're doing long-term work in six communities directly and another six communities with other, other funders to think about how we can deal with some of the root causes of some of the issues. Nationally, we will continue to campaign and advocate. And uh, Diana Barron mentioned the Green Paper. It might seem very dry, but actually the Green Paper could be more important. Many of you talked about what funders should do. More important than what funders do do will be what local government does and what national government does. And I'd really urge you to look at the Green Paper. There's a response on our website. There'll be a link in the chat. Do think about your own response to the Green Paper because it's important that charities have their say. At the moment, we're far too concerned it's focused on products and not people, and it simply won't work for small local organizations. So have your say. So our challenge as policymakers, if you're policymakers in this call, are we going to stick around? Are we going to be there? Um, it's great to hear Stephen say that small charities were here long before local authorities arrived and will be here afterwards. And that's really important to remember. You've been here a long time and you're still going to be here, irrespective of what funding comes. But if you like, we've got 10 days before the budget. You've got 10 days to get dropped, to come out of this email send a letter to your MP, send an email to your MP, get as many of your constituents and many of the people who support you to send notes to your MP talking about how important small charities are. Diana Barron indicated there may be no more resources for small charities. Well, there's still 10 days to save that. And at the very least, we can get mentions of the importance of small charities. So we have a government that thinks about social infrastructure as much as it thinks about HS2 and the vital role of small organizations. So read the research, think about the recommendations, fill in the poll so we can improve future events. Do come out of this email, find the contact for your MP, contact them and ask 50 people you know to do the same because that will create pressure. There's 10 days to do this. Governments do change their minds in 10 days. Put pressure on them to think about what Charis is doing right now on the front line as this report really echoes. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to further events like this as we publish further research. Many thanks. Bye.